Um, no one is more happy to see the room full than me, let me tell you. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for uh, staying. I appreciate it very much. Um, I'm going to quickly tell you about us, if I can make this work properly. If. There we go. We are a cultural branding consultancy. And there's been a few references this afternoon around uh, cultural anthropology, and that's our area of expertise. The problem that we see is that most of our clients want to be able to make better decisions before they create their advertising or before they design their packaging in order to have better success in the marketplace. So we come at it from this point of view. We have a fundamental belief that every decision a consumer makes is an act of culture. And as they're navigating through their lives, the brands and the choices that they make are artifacts of their journey. Basically, most of our clients make products that nobody needs. It, all of our clients, their products are actually irrelevant to survival. However, people want those products because value has been created in them. And our culture is what does that. Okay? That's the premise. When we say culture, we often get the question, well, what do you mean by culture? And you know, are we talking about ethnicity? And sometimes it's ethnicity. But we, uh, uh, several of you have stopped by our, our table today, which I'm very grateful for as well, and have some interesting conversations. Mary Kay Cosmetics. The kind of people that sell Mary Kay Cosmetics are a subculture. Okay? They're an interesting group of people that probably have different motivations than the average person that's only willing to go to Sephora and buy their cosmetics. Right? People are subcultures. So we don't necessarily look just at the trends, the things that we can all observe. We go a level deeper than that, which is, what are the cultural rules? What are the foundations, even all the way to, to Maslow, God love the guy, you know, the, the human needs that people have that are driving the value that they end up attributing uh, to different products. Great thing about culture is it's a marketer's playground. Okay? It, you know, there are rules of behavior, so in our culture there are certain rules around, let's take the example of higher education. We have a rule in our society that it's better to go to college, it's better to go to university than to drop out of high school. Okay, there, there's an expectation created. But culture is rife with tensions. You know, we live in a complicated society and there's lots of things that are pulling us in lots of different directions. And when there's tension, marketers can get in there and play. And the great thing is that it's always changing. So there's always something new in culture that brands can bring to bear on their business. So it's very fertile ground. The point is that the cultural landscape is usually hidden. And our job as an agency is to make it unhidden, to make it uh, viewable for clients so that they can use culture to build disproportionate attraction for their brands. Okay? So think attractors whether they be motivators or emotions or feelings or we almost don't care. All we, t all we think about is what is it that can make the fly come to this flame? What's the attractor that we can leverage? So I'm going to give you an example. The American myth okay, is, is uh, it's tremendous, known all around the world. The self-made man is, is, is kind of the story. The basic idea here is you know, America was clawed from the tyranny of the British class and privilege and formed into an exceptional nation by men who believed in liberty, merit, and self-discipline. Okay? That's why there is a level playing field in a meritocracy in America, and that's why it's fantastic. The meaning, though, for the average person is, if you work hard, you too will be rewarded. It almost gives you goosebumps, doesn't it? It's fantastic. Well, something happened in 2008. Okay, this is a sheriff who is visiting or uh, clearing a house that has been repossessed by the bank. He's got his gun drawn. I, I cannot find another symbol of the collapse of the American dream than this one. This gives me goosebumps when I look at this picture, and I've, I've given this talk a hundred times. Right? Something has happened. Well, here's what's interesting. You think about that as a context change in our, in our culture. Okay? <coughs> When the American dream dissolves, what that means is that the average citizen is told, because we're bailing out institutions that are too big to fail, that in fact your hard work doesn't matter and you're not going to be rewarded. It is a real betrayal at a cultural level. What's really interesting is that there were two brands created out of that. Right? One is the Tea Party and the other is the Occupy Wall Street movement. Right? 
they are directly a result from the upheaval in, the, in, in 2008. For one, the villain was the government, and for the other, the villain was the corporation, but they culturally resonated and told people what the explanation for the meltdown was and how they should act and what they should go do. Well, of course, we're students of marketing, so here's what we think about. The other thing that happened over that period of time, before 2008, what was the most popular thing in pop culture? Vampires, okay? Vampires are really interesting cultural properties because they're very powerful beings. They have a lot of self-agency. Okay, they can transcend time and space, sexual boundaries. They're really amazing creatures. Okay, vampires are usually drawn as being very attractive uh, characters. What's interesting is what's popular now? Zombies. Zombies have almost no personal agency. Right? They have no control, they are simply almost automatons you know, being controlled by some other force. Is that analogous to how people feel having their hard work, you know, the rewards for their hard work taken away from them? You know, do people feel victimized and out of control? It's no wonder that zombies are actually pretty popular now. Right? So now if you were a content creator or, uh, or you know, one of the uh, entertainment companies and you had a lot of inventory of vampire uh, stuff because you were following that trend, guess what? You're not selling a lot of vampire stuff right now, right? You missed the point that the market pivoted because of a shifting culture. So what we try to do is understand what's going on in culture and try to anticipate, well, how does that create an opportunity or a risk for our clients and their brands? That's the foresight part of culture. For our society, in all of North America, in fact, most of the Western world, the myths that we relied upon to, to, to guide us through our lives are actually a bit broken right now. We've had lots of betrayals, whether it be business uh, officials, clergy, government. We've been let down unlike many generations before us. So our myths are in transition. There's a need for new stories, and culture is where those myths exist. And so that means there's an opportunity for marketers to walk in and create some ways for people to make meaning in their lives through the use of their brands. So we've created a playground where marketers can go in and play with this. And I invite you all to visit our new Cultural Forces Lab. It's a chemistry set for marketers. And basically on the left-hand side are cultural forces that our wonderful anthropologists have come up with. And on the right-hand side are some of the brands that have activated. And you basically get to go in and play. Okay? You can look at a cultural force or you can look at a brand and see how they've activated upon it. And the idea here is let marketers understand how some brands have used culture to be successful. And hopefully the marketers will say, I want some of that. And we can start building some cultural foresight and strategy into their business. But the point is that when cultural elements combine, they give rise to peculiar needs. And when those peculiar needs happen, they create opportunities for peculiar products and services. This is the best example I can give for this kind of work. Chipotle sells burritos, right? Well, why would, you sell, why would you go there and buy your burrito rather than all the other places in America that you can buy burritos? They create a film. How many people have seen the Scarecrow film? A few. That's good. There's been 13 million hits on YouTube. I think I'm about a half a million of them, but uh, it's very popular. If you haven't seen it, just go to YouTube and, and, and search for Scarecrow, and you'll see this screen will come up. It's an animated film. I think it's probably a masterpiece of cultural branding. What's really important is that they use a couple of tensions that are important. One is America is a cheap food culture. Okay? This is the land of plenty. Everybody should have the food they need to grow and prosper and be happy. All of that is made possible by an industrial food system. Okay? Well, there are some anxieties around the industrial food system. When we find out that there are some very large fast food manufacturers using a thing called pink slime, and I won't even tell you what that is <laughs> if you don't know, in the hamburgers, or there's salmonella recalls, or there's E. coli in, in, the, in the hamburger meat, all of these things create anxiety around the system that actually enables the cheap food culture. So there's tension. They capitalize that, dramatize it in a very creative way, and the most important thing is the little graph down the bottom left-hand corner. It tripled the share price. 
Do any of us have any clients or are there any clients in the room that would love to triple your share price? Here's how you do it. It's cultural branding. Here's some of the work that we've done in terms of foresight strategy and innovation. Uh, Nissan, everybody knows Nissan. Uh, way up in Canada, they have this very tiny, tiny car that doesn't exist in America. It's the cheapest car you can buy, okay? Now everybody thinks, well, that's a no-brainer. It's the cheapest thing. Of course it's gonna sell. But people make assumptions about who the audience is for that kind of vehicle. Oh, that's gonna be new graduates because they can't afford anything else. They're just starting out, they need it, right? Well, interestingly, there's a bunch of 45-year-olds who are making the choice into that kind of vehicle because they're an interesting subgroup where they're making different economic choices than other generations have. And so for Nissan, it was a bit of an eye-opener when they said, well, wait a minute, you mean we shouldn't be trading them up to luxury fe features in larger cars when they came into the dealership? We said, no. These are quirky people, and you need to celebrate how quirky they are. And when they come in the dealership, your job is to close a sale as fast as you can and not get in the way and try to sell them up to a larger vehicle because they've already made their mind up. Okay? There's an interesting cultural tension around how people are making different choices than previous uh, decades, all enabled by 2008. Thank you very much. They spent $100,000 with us. They made $40 million in 12 weeks. I can't take credit for all the 40 million, but it's a pretty good return story. The next one is uh, one of our healthcare clients, EpiPen, for anyone who has kids that have uh, anaphylaxis, you know, a, a severe allergy, they could die. Um, they, uh, you know, the, the pharma industry, of course, thinks that everything gets solved through education. So they, their idea was, let's find out the people that are really vigilant and own three or four or five EpiPens and tape them to their kids' heads and their feet and put them in their gym bags in the car and let's just find out why other people don't, and let's just tell them what they believe, and then surely they'll act the same way and everybody will be protected and we'll sell a million pens. Everyone's gonna be happy. Well, we found out that uh, the people that are not very vigilant, in fact, they're downright reckless, tend to be middle-aged professional men or doctors. <laughs> it's very strange. There are some tragic stories of doctors that have died as a result of not carrying their, their EpiPens, and lots of men. But the interesting thing was that people do not simply react to the education the way you would think of it, uh, that you think they would. They rationalize away all the risk. We minimize risk when we can't resolve it. It's the same reason the entire state of California is living on a fault line, yet nobody moves away. Oh, it probably won't happen to me. That was the logic, okay? It won't happen to me. So we went back and told them and their agency that, you know what, you're not gonna be able to educate people out of this mindset. Unfortunately, they said, you know what, we're gonna try anyways. And we went through three rounds of advertising testing and every type of concept, we, I think we must have put 30 concepts in front of people to try to scare them straight. They found every reason that it didn't apply to them. Oh, I don't eat at Chinese restaurants, or I, always, I, I don't eat out at restaurants at all, in fact. Or I hate seafood anyways. It doesn't matter if I'm allergic to it. Oh, every person had an excuse why it didn't apply to them. And so we simply said to them, guys, we told you, don't use logic. Just use something that's very disruptive. In the pharma industry, no one has a sense of humor. So they tried humor. They got a woman standing in a bucket of water about to plug in her hair dryer in her towel, and it says, you wouldn't try this at home, or what does it say? Sorry, I forgot the line. Um, you wouldn't do this in real life. So it's disarmed them. So why aren't you carrying your EpiPen? And it added a two-step little uh, test that they could self-assess whether they were uh, 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 candidates or, or not. It doubled their business, 100% growth. Does anyone have a client that wants to grow their business 100%? These are the kind of insights that, that can lead to that kind of business growth. Now, of course, I will say that it's not just the creative that ended up driving that, it's the fact that their sales department lined up behind the strategy because they believed in it. And they executed like they've never executed before. That's also a great value of good research and good insights and good strategies. The last one is a tiny little uh, uh, co-op dairy that had no innovation pipeline. They know that innovation is key to success and they were really struggling with how to get started. We used culture as a leaping off point to drive a, a whole a series of, of innovation ideation sessions. They've ended up launching a product that is ex exceeding their expectations. Okay, I'm not gonna tell you that it's the greatest product in the entire grocery store, but it's exceeding their expectations. How many clients have launched a product that you know of that has exceeded their expectations? 
almost none. 80% of new products fail after being in market for a year. So we can use culture to at least achieve the objectives, if not exceed them. And of course, now they have a full pipeline, so they're really, really happy. That's all I have. I am absolutely thrilled to see so many people here being the last speaker of the day. And let's go have a drink. It's all on me. <laughs>